Well, good afternoon, everybody, or should I say good morning? We're absolutely thrilled to have Barry Eichengreen, Professor Barry Eichengreen, dialing in from Berkeley, California, uh, and a real delight to have you here uh, this afternoon or morning, Barry. Good to be here. Well, uh, the topic today is one that interested me greatly when I heard about Barry's book, uh, Sanctions and the Dollar. And we have always had this uh, love-hate relationship with the dollar, particularly, I might add, uh, over here in Europe, where uh, you know we resent it, we resent it, we resent it. It's definitely going to fall, and yet we continue to use it. Uh, I'm always reminded of the old Woody Allen joke where he's, uh, he goes to the doctor and he says, doctor, doctor, my brother thinks he's a chicken. And he says, well, you know, tell him to stop. And Woody Allen says, we can't, we need the eggs. Um, and this is, I think, one of the, one of the challenges here. So we're going to be exploring uh, that today as, as we go through. And you'll know me, I'm Michael Minelli, one of the directors of Zen. And it really is a delight to be able to introduce so many of these fascinating webinars over the years. Uh, but we can only do so thanks to the tolerance, generosity, and wide-ranging interests of our sponsors around the world. Uh, so we thank you. And clearly, uh, when we're talking about sanctions and the dollar, uh, whether it's uh, Ukraine, Iran, North Korea, various uh, dictators and dictatorships uh, in, in Africa, whatever, uh, it's very clear that the dollar has, over the years, move from being a dominant currency to being a reserve currency uh, to being a tool of uh, political use uh, of varying degrees, which I think we can also explore. Now, the format today is a fairly straightforward one. I'm, I'm going to get out of the way as quickly as I can. Uh, and then uh, Barry's going to chat for 20 minutes. And then we're going to be depending on you, as we always do, for questions, answers, comments, and observations. Uh, so a few points of housekeeping. Yes, this is being recorded. However, uh, contrary to most of our things, Barry's slides are going to be reserved and not available, uh, but the recording will be up in approximately two working days, which I will be uh, probably over the weekend or Monday morning. Uh, but how do you participate in the Q&A? It's very straightforward. You use the GoToWebinar question and answer facility. That has one major advantage, all of your comments, questions, and observations will be sent to Barry with your email attached. If you want to get in touch with him, point something out to him, what have you. Uh, so you definitely use it that way. But also, I'm here with you uh, and Barry, and I am not sitting on uh, LinkedIn or Twitter or email or any other means of communication. So it's the way to participate and get your comments and questions in. Now, we have a poll as well. So fingers on buzzers, uh, those of you out there. So just before we start, uh, and I hand over to Barry, what do you see as the global reserve currency in 2050? Uh, the renminbi, the euro, gold, stable coins, uh, uh, possibly we should have added cryptocurrencies separately, but stable coin cryptocurrencies or the US dollar. Barry, one of the great things uh, about our audience is uh, that they're very quick off the mark, uh, very fast at absorbing information. Uh, well over 50% had voted already, so I'm just going to leave it open for a second so we can get a bit of the temperature of the audience. I think we're ready to close that one with virtually everyone voting. And here you go. Whoa! Well, uh, over two-thirds believe that the U.S. dollar dominance is going to persist for another uh, another 27 years, which is which is a, a a real sign of what we what we all think. Well, I think that's a, a super way to start. Barry, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Michael. So um, let me share my screen. That's visible to you now? Yes, we can see it. Good. Um, I um, am, am really uh, happy to have the opportunity to speak to this audience. Um, I was um, relieved that panelists and hosts do not vote on the poll. Forecasting is hard, especially when it involves the future, especially when it involves the year 2050. So. Uh, no doubt we will come back to those issues in any case. So I do want to talk about the implications of sanctions in general and recent U.S. G7 sanctions on Russia in particular and their implications for the dollar and the international monetary system. Uh, the question is whether those sanctions have fundamentally, fundamentally changed the economic and financial landscape uh, I think they have rendered uh, holding uh, central bank reserves uh, in the form of U.S. bank deposits and, and, and securities 
uh, as riskier in the eyes of governments around the world, contemplating even the remote possibility that they may end up on the outs with the United States. The kind of sanctions that have been imposed on the Bank of Russia are unprecedented in the sense that uh, central bank reserves are traditionally protected by sovereign immunity. There are a few exceptions to the rule in the case of the United States. Invoking such an exception requires the president to uh, declare that the target was responsible for state-sponsored terrorism that poses an immediate national security threat to the United States. Such declarations were issued in the cases of Iran and Afghanistan, but interestingly, no such declaration was issued in 2022 in the case of Russia. So this time is different in that sense. Um, with what implications, one might ask, um, where might uh, central banks perceiving that holding reserves in the form of dollars, where might they turn going forward? And what might the implications be uh, in, in the longer term <laughs> between now and 2050? So, Michael, uh, a little bit contrary to what you said earlier, I don't yet have a book on sanctions and the dollar. That book is a glimmer, still a glimmer in my eye, but I do have an earlier book from 10 years ago on uh, the rise and fall of the dollar and the future of the international monetary system. So exorbitant, the dollar's exorbitant privilege was the phrase invoked by Charles de Gaulle's finance minister, uh, Giscard d'Estaing in uh, 1965. And, and the question when I wrote that book and the question that has been renewed uh, last year in this one is whether the dollar is uh, poised to lose its exorbitant privilege as the world's international and reserve currency. What are the alternatives? Uh, many of the potential alternatives, the issuers of the Euro, the Yen, Sterling are on board with US sanctions against Russia. Uh, China and its renminbi, perhaps, although uh, in my view, China's invasion of Ukraine is a reminder of the danger of putting all your financial eggs in the basket of an authoritarian leader who can arbitrarily change the rules of the geopolitical or financial game. Uh, and China's cross-border payment system, the alternative, its alternative to SWIFT and uh, the New York Clearinghouse, Fedwire and so forth, its system is still underdeveloped. I'll come back to that. Gold, well, gold is safe from garnishment if it is repatriated and warehoused at home, but it's clunky. It's hard to use in cross-border payments. It's hard to use as collateral for financial transactions, which do, uh, uh, dollar reserves, in which context dollar reserves are actively used. Crypto, that is inevitably uh, the question, especially in uh, along the borders of, of Silicon Valley, where I live. I think the attractions of, of, of crypto have clearly dimmed in, in light of recent events. Um, my co-authors uh, who work at the International Monetary Fund and I, so nothing I'm about to say here is official IMF policy, have looked at historical cases of sanctions going back a couple of decades and more. Uh, the United States has increasingly resorted to financial sanctions uh, in human rights cases over geopolitical disputes. And there is no evidence, in fact, that past sanctions imposed by the United States cause the target countries to move away from the dollar and toward other currencies. Russia did move in that direction away from US Treasury securities toward alternative alternatives actually starting in 2013, immediately before its invasion and annexation of Crimea. And it had essentially liquidated all of its dollar, um, uh, all, all of its U.S. Treasury bonds prior to the um, uh, its attack on Ukraine in 2022. So again, uh, there's little evidence of a generalized move away from the dollar in response to past 
sanctions, all, although again, there's the possibility that next time may be different given the unprecedented nature of these sanctions. What about gold? Uh, my co-authors and I uh, uh, looked at uh, case study evidence, uh, starting with the 10 largest increases in the share of gold in reserves in the 21st century. And half of the 10 cases we list here were uh, associated with the imposition of sanctions. Each of these cases is special. Other factors were at work, but it's interesting that there is this association between uh, moving away from financial uh, securities and toward gold in response to sanctions. Um, the Wall Street Journal and others have commented on how central banks have been piling into gold uh, recently and especially in 2022. So that's at least uh, a suggestive correlation. Uh, in response to which my co-authors and I uh, gathered data for 184 countries, all the countries that report their gold reserve holdings to the IMF going all the way back to 1980. And we looked at um, US, EU, Japanese, and UK sanctions. And we do find in general that uh, the threat or imposition of sanctions does lead to a shift toward gold reserves on the part of central banks, although that shift is quantitatively has been very, very small. So the share of reserves held in, in, in gold increase on average by four percentage points from, I don't know, 15% to 19% on that order of magnitude in response to sanctions in the past. The effect is there, but the effect is small because holding reserves in the form of gold renders them secure from sanctions, but doesn't give them a lot of utility, if you will. So on balance, there is limited evidence of changes in reserve composition due to sanctions because of uh, the existence of only limited alternatives. And because more broadly, if you look back at history, uh, changes in reserve structure tend to proceed very slowly, gradually, even glacially over time. So if we look at the last uh, two decades, for example, the dollar's share of global foreign exchange reserves has fallen from roughly 70% of the world total to about 60% of the world total over 20 years. So it has fallen by one half of one percentage point per year. Uh, and I would expect this trend to continue other things equal because the United States over time is likely to account for a gradually declining share of global GDP, global trade, global finance. The US is a mature economy, emerging markets will continue presumably to emerge as the weight of the US economy continues to decline, the role of the dollar in the US economy will continue to fall, but I would expect those dual processes to unfold gradually rather than abruptly. Um, and that is in fact the trend I predicted in, 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 in this book, Exorbitant Privilege, 10 years ago. So I li like to recall predictions I, I, I make that turn out to be right. Honesty requires me to acknowledge I made two predictions in that book. One was right, the dollar's share would gradually decline. The other one was wrong, that the movement would be from the dollar toward, uh, in, in the main toward the Euro and the Chinese renminbi. And uh, that second prediction has not been borne out. Uh, so what we've seen uh, in the main is a shift away from the dollar and toward non-traditional reserve currencies issued by smaller economies. Uh, three quarters of the shift away from the dollar has been toward currencies like the Canadian dollar, the Australian dollar, the Swedish krona, the Norwegian krona, the South Korean won, the currencies of well-managed economies whose fortunes don't um, fluctuate in lockstep with those of the United States. So their currencies provide diversification 
benefits uh, over the last decade, more attractive returns. Only one quarter of the shift away from the dollar has been toward the Chinese renminbi. So my co-authors and I identified a list of 46 central banks that have moved uh, in this direction toward uh, uh, diversifying their reserve portfolios toward non-traditional currencies and holding at least 5% of their reserves in that form. So uh, here is our list of non-traditional reserve currencies. I failed to mention the New Zealand dollar, the Danish krona, uh, et cetera, et cetera, but you can, you can see their relative weight end of 2020 in this table. <coughs> Excuse me. And there is uh, on the next slide, a longer table of probably too long and too, too small to actually read that shows you which central banks and, and, and countries have moved in this direction. The point is that this is a very long list. It's a very heterogeneous um, grouping of central banks. The United Kingdom is right there smack dab in the middle. But at the top are, for example, African countries that do a lot of trade with South Africa and hold the RAND to a significant extent now as, um, as reserves. Uh, so this is quite an interesting collection of um, countries. These are publicly available data hiding on obscure pages of the IMF's website. But if you go there and hunt around, you can um, see this evidence for yourself. I see several factors as contributing to these uh, developments. First, improvements in foreign exchange market technology, electronic trading platforms, automated market making, matching algorithms, automated liquidity management algorithms that incentivize currency holders uh, to provide them to these platforms when there is a demand, making for more foreign exchange market liquidity, making it easier to trade these non-traditional reserve currencies. So um, until recently, if you were a Mexican importer of Canadian maple syrup, uh, you had to take your Canadian pesos by US dollars and use them to buy Canadian dollars to pay uh, the Canadian supplier. Now you can trade uh, the peso and, 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 the, and the Canadian dollar directly for one another, making it more attractive uh, to use them, make it, making it more important for central banks who might want to provide Canadian dollar liquidity in their role as lenders of last resort to, to hold the currency. Secondly, central banks many of them have larger reserve portfolios. They have not only a liquidity tranche that they use, but an investment tranche that they invest, and they are more actively managing and chasing returns, which has driven them toward higher yielding currencies. And third, that until very recently, uh, the principal reserve currencies, uh, the dollar, the euro, uh, sterling, have had low yields and relatively high uh, volatility. Uh, that may now be changing as the yields on the dollar and sterling, um, what is the Bank of England about to do as, as those yields go up? But if you look historically, as we do in this table, the euro and the yen uh, uh, have been unattractive because interest rates on them have been zero or even negative. Um, the Australian dollar, the Canadian dollar, and the renminbi with positive yields and, and very low volatility. Here, uh, yields are um, normalized by volatility. That's the so-called sharp ratio. You can see the Aussie dollar, the Canadian dollar, and the renminbi have been attractive until recently. Are things about to change and how, how might that affect uh, the picture? Why doesn't the euro play a more important role? Because there is a shortage of triple A rated uh, public label securities to be held by reserves, by corporate treasurers and central bank reserve managers. So the last time I looked, there were only three triple A euro area sovereigns and many of the uh, government bonds that they have issued have been hoovered up by the European Central Bank or have to be held by uh, 
uh, European commercial banks as reserves, leaving relatively little to be held by central bank reserve managers outside Europe. It now looks like the European Recovery Fund, uh, circa 2020, uh, it, it, it's still being ramped up and it looks increasingly like a one-off. It doesn't look like it's going to change this anytime soon. So I've done some calculations comparing the stock of AAA rated government securities in Europe. That's this uh, 5 trillion US dollar equivalent number, which is dwarfed by the $16 trillion of US treasury securities. And if you subtract off of that 5 trillion of, of euro area, US dollar equivalent securities, those that have been immobilized by the ECB or European commercial banks, you get an even smaller number here, which is dwarfed to an even greater extent by the availability of dollars. So people point to different constraints on the adoption of the euro as an international and reserve currency. To my mind, the fundamental constraint is there aren't enough high quality euro area public label assets to go around. Um, why doesn't the renminbi play a more important role? China's cross-border interbank payments system is still only uh, 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 shadow compared to the New York Clearinghouse and Fedwire. Uh, CIPS has only 10% 10, 10 the number of participating banks as chips. It clears only 2% by value the transactions daily that chips clears. Uh, China's been trying to get it up and running for six years now. Uh, it's still trying. China continues to operate capital controls, which limits certain kinds of cross-border transactions. And to my mind, uh, uh, doing your bank cross-border banking business in Shanghai rather than New York is unattractive for many uh, uh, international users because of China's governance, because of the Politburo's ability to change the rules of the financial game arbitrarily. Uh, U.S. financial sanctions may be unprecedented, but there are lots of checks and balances on what the U.S. Treasury can and cannot uh, do. In fact, much of the demand for renminbi reserves, in fact, comes from Russia, who holds the renminbi as reserves. These data are hiding in plain view on the, on the IMF website as well. A third of them are held by Russia. That's the blue slice of the pie. Um, Brazil, interestingly, is, is holder number two. Who knew that? I, I didn't before we got into this project. So countries are beginning to hold more renminbi as reserves, but they're mainly, as I said before, moving in different directions toward uh, holding the currencies of, of small, open, interestingly, politically democratic countries. What can China do? It can continue to ramp up its cross-border interbank payments system, SIPs. It can encourage, allow for use of its central bank digital currency. Um, uh, it doesn't allow that cross-border use at the moment. Uh, final set of points. What about uh, crypto? Clearly, plain vanilla cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin are too volatile to appear to to appeal to respectable financial institutions like central banks. And stable coins, in my view, are either not stable because they're only partially or algorithmically collateralized and therefore subject to bank run like problems, or if they're fully collateralized or over collateralized by actual existing bank deposits or US Treasury bills, they won't scale because I would have to give you more than $1 in order to get back $1 worth of stablecoin, not an attractive uh, bargain for anyone who is not a money launderer or tax evader or whatever. What about central bank digital currencies? Finally, uh, the point again is that CBDCs cannot be used cross-border at the moment. To use China's eCNY, you have to be resident in China. Allowing foreigners to hold significant amounts of, of eCNY would 
provide an avenue for evading China's capital controls. Other countries will be reluctant to allow their residents to hold China's eCNY because that would create dollarization like currency substitution problems and, and vitiate the, the effectiveness of domestic monetary policy. So I think this is unlikely to happen. Uh, the Bank for International Settlements has been cooperating with central banks in, in, in building these multiple CBDC bridges, M bridges, they're called. They're basically an electronic corridor where one CBDC can be traded for another. We know how to do these things technically. We just don't know how to agree in terms of governance on their operation. We know technically how uh, multiple CBDCs could run on a single blockchain. Again, no technical obstacle, but if you think world trade organization governance is hard, imagine the difficulty of getting agreement between the Fed and the People's Bank of China and 180 other central banks on governance of the relevant blockchain. Um, and the private sector is hard at work on uh, uh, improving the efficiency of cross-border payments and bringing down costs very significantly. So I think um, uh, the dollar's dominance will continue to erode, but it will continue to erode very slowly. Uh, John Connolly famous re famously remarked that the dollar is our currency and your problem. Uh, in, in the conclusion to that earlier IMF working paper, um, we, uh, my concluding line was that dollar is unlikely to be felled by another uh, giant, but it will be increasingly challenged by a swarm of midgets. I was told by management that that uh, sentence was politically incorrect, so we took it out. Thank you very much. Barry, that's great. Uh, a wonderful and succinct exposition of a complex area and uh, one that has obviously uh, <laughs> ignited our audience. So I'll, I'll get cracking on that in just a split second. Um, I have always loved uh, the John Connolly quote. You know, he was a he was a heck of a bruiser, a heavy hitter amongst heavy hitters, I think, in his day. Um, and, uh, and it reminds me of, uh, was it Paul Krugman who said, Americans make a living selling each other's houses paid for with money borrowed from the Chinese. So it's uh, not quite accurate, but it's, it's worth a stab. Anyway, we've got a lot of comments and questions and keep them coming. Um, is, here we go, Trevor Hilder. Now the, the classic um, issue has always been, yeah, but if my currency is doing really well, my exporters are doing badly. So Trevor wants to know, is the US uh, dollar reserve currency status a big problem for US exporters? No, I think um, it, 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 it is a modest burden for U.S. Uh, exporters. So the dollar is uh, very slightly stronger as a result of, of this additional demand for U.S. financial assets coming from uh, foreign central banks and corporate treasurers and others who hold it as the kind of the bedrock of their portfolios. The U.S. Treasury can borrow for uh, uh, at very slightly lower uh, rates as a result of this captive demand for U.S. Treasury securities. But I think there is a long list of uh, uh, other factors that are much more important for U.S. export competitiveness, education and training, R&D, uh, um, marketing, what have you. Mm. Um, Calvin Lee is kind of curious, what if we measure the relationship between the flow of reserves instead of the stock of reserves with regard to sanctions? Do you see a difference there? Well, so we um, do look for changes uh, over time and uh, those um, changes are evident in the data. Uh, you can take the stock data that I look at and, and compare you year over year and you do see the, uh, the flows. So I would argue uh, we basically get the same picture. Okay. okay. Uh, a slightly more discursive uh, question from Hugh Purser. Uh, to, to what extent are reserve currency holdings a mirror of trading patterns, especially dollar denominated trade? Um, we, you know, people frequently refer to the oil and gas markets featuring the dollar as the price element that drags the market around. Um, but many proposals for 
baskets of whatever haven't really arisen either. Yeah, so if, if you look at the determinants uh, of these holdings, trade flows are important. Uh, uh, the extent to which other countries trade with the United States or trade with countries whose currencies move in, in, in more or less in lockstep with the dollar. Number two, reserve holdings depend on financial flows as well, who uh, is, is doing financial business with the United States. And number three, uh, reserve holdings depend on geopolitical alliances as well. So if you, you look at modern data or if you look at historic data, if you, I've for fun looked at the period before World War I with the double alliance and the triple alliance and um, these different groups that formed in the run up to the war, countries uh, held as reserves the currencies of, of their alliance partners. So trade is a factor, but it's one of several. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Thomas Brooks is curious, uh, to what extent do BRICS, uh, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, plus countries, hold each other's currencies as their reserve currencies? Uh, at the moment, the answer is, is only to a very slight degree that uh, you saw in uh, the pie chart I showed you that one BRIC Brazil uh, holds a surprisingly large share of uh, the total stock uh, of Renmin B foreign exchange reserves. There is similarly talk uh, whenever um, uh, there's unhappiness about the outsized role of the dollar about creating a BRICS reserve currency. So most recently, I think that talk came from, from Mr. Putin, perhaps on a visit to India. I don't quite recall, but that's, um, all, all in the manner of talk. I think we uh, know from history that the synthetic reserve currencies, be they the, um, the ECU uh, in the 1970s or special drawing rights of the International Monetary Fund uh, have very limited appeal because they, they don't have a sovereign state standing uh, behind them. Uh, and I think that would be true of a, a BRICS reserve currency as well. Um, I'm really pleased you raised uh, special drawing rights, SDRs, because actually that was a personal question I wanted to ask you. Uh, I mean, these were always talked up for a while, and I know it's faded, but once in a great while, people come back and go, well, you could go into SDRs. And over here in London, back in 2000, there was an attempt to create something called the WOKU, which was really a world currency unit, but it was just actually an algorithmic averaging of the uh, top 20 or 25 uh, countries by GDP. Um, that wound up with a, a larger proportion of euro denominated stuff in it, sort of seven or eight countries were in the euro. But it was an interesting attempt, but there was no backing to it. It was just an algorithmic basket. But the attack that it made was actually against the politicization of the SDRs, so that the SDRs really had a governance issue. You were never sure when they'd change. Uh, I think it was a, originally, wasn't it like a five year uh, review? So uh, vastly out of whack with world trade. So was the SDR uh, a governance problem or was it, uh, you know, as, as you just alluded to earlier, uh, one where it was really that the, the countries themselves were finding the, the basket untenable? Well, I think um, there is um, no commercial use of the SDR despite uh, modest efforts on the part of the IMF from time to time to encourage such private use. Uh, it's easy for investors to roll their own if they want a currency basket. Uh, there, it's easy for them to um, create it through their 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 own portfolio diversification decisions. If there is an argument for some kind of standardized basket that everybody holds and use uses. Uh, it could be the, the the unit the IMF creates, or it could be a unit that J.P. Morgan or you know pick your favorite. Uh, investment bank creates for its customers and there have been various efforts over, over the years to do that but um, uh, none of these basket-based units ha seem to have had much appeal. Do they um, not uh, mirror uh, the pattern of trade in di different countries to an adequate uh, extent? Uh, is having uh, 
at an, an investment bank promising to make a liquid market in a in a basket less attractive to investors than knowing that there is a, a liquidity provider of last resort in, in, in the form of the Federal Reserve standing behind the market in dollars. I don't think we really know the answer, but we know from the history that there are serious obstacles here. Okay. Um, Andrew Lung put a question in. I, I believe Andrew might be dialing in from China um, or Hong Kong. Um, and I'm going to read his question out, but I, I might, uh, you can address it if you wish directly. And I've got a sort of a supplementary. So Andrew's written, not only sanctions on Russia, but the dollar has been drastically weaponized to impose long arm coercion on other countries, especially China. Also, the global supply and value chain has in recent years been tilted towards China. Moreover, China has been accelerating the development of digital sovereign currency. And additionally, bilateral trade, especially in energy transactions, is likely to be denominated in currencies other than dollars. dollar. Uh, while the renminbi is unlikely to usurp the dominant role of the dollar anytime soon, would not dollar dominance erosion be accelerated in coming years? Um, I think that um, the dollar's dominance the erosion of the dollar's dominance could be accelerated in coming years if we in the United States shoot ourselves in the foot. So I think uh, the prospects hinge more on uh, politics and economics in the United States than they do on politics and economics in, in China, if you will. Uh, I'm, I'm alluding most immediately to the debt ceiling, of course, and we have never uh, had a suspension of payments on U.S. Treasury bonds, which could happen in the second half of this year, or prioritization of the bondholders and uh, raising serious questions about the ability of the country to govern itself in, in terms of, uh, of other public functions. I would observe at the same time, if do dollar dominance could survive four years of Donald Trump, it can survive a lot in, 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 in terms of political uncertainties and uh, governance problems. So uh, I, I, I do worry about that. I would uh, observe for China that China's footprint in the global economic and financial system is growing quickly, but it's starting out really from very, very low levels. So as I said before, China's cross-border payment system clears 2% by value the daily transactions that ships, which is only one of two US clearinghouses, clears. Uh, China, the renminbi accounts for 2% of payments through SWIFT, where the dollar accounts for like 45% last time I looked. China still relies on SWIFT as its messaging system for its own payments system. And the renminbi as we, uh, saw earlier is, is, is still only 3% uh, of global reserves as opposed to the dollars, 60%. Um, so uh, even if you imagine that, uh, that the growth of payments through SIPs, China system continues to grow by 50% a year, which is how fast it grew last year, it will take 20 years before payments through its system match uh, payments through the New York Clearinghouse. And we know China's economy will continue to decelerate as it matures, and the growth of its financial transactions will decelerate along with it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's kind of who needs to press that. We have uh, U.S. presidential elections and, uh, and U.S. budgetary crises. But anyway, um, uh, I think J.P. Thompson would like to expand on where, where you just ended that question to Andrew. He's saying, uh, how would Barry read debt and, debt and demographics here uh, with regard to China? You know, what's the impact on productivity? The U.S. debt ceiling may go up, but the PRC's debt and demographic prospects are perhaps more challenging. So how does how do debt and demographics play into your assessment of the reserve currency question? Well, so uh, I, I, I think both debt and demographics matter in this context, uh, but productivity growth matters, uh, if anything, even more fundamentally. Um, economists do not understand productivity growth. We cannot forecast it reliably. Uh, I think we 
uh, have reason to think that a, a, a well-managed, flexible market economy can develop and uh, uh, apply the new technologies that uh, are fundamental to productivity growth, to growing the platform for these global currencies uh, better than uh, an authoritarian state. So um, you have to be a political prognosticator to know whether the US will remain well governed, whether China uh, is now turning back toward a market economy and being more friendly to the private sector. Uh, that was its uh, advertising campaign at Davos last month. Uh, is that turn credible? Is it uh, durable? Um, but I, I, you know, I think uh, demographics will be more of a drag for China. Who knows going forward uh, who's going to have the more serious debt problem. But at the end of the day, it's your ability to grow productivity uh, that I think will tell the tale. Hmm. Um, I found something really fascinating in, in your talk there. We, we had, a, we had a, two years ago um, a chap on the name of Jim Briding, uh, and he wrote a book called Too Small to Fail about the S8 nations. Um, and these were um, Finland, Switzerland, Sweden, Singapore, Netherlands, Ireland, Israel, I don't know if I'm missing one. Um, and what was interesting to me was when you were looking at where those moves have gone, they've actually gone into into those, uh, particularly when I looked, those that were within the EU, took them out. Really, really, really interesting. He didn't put Norway on the list because he, he thinks Norway is great, but left it left it over. And what they what they what what characterized all all of these nations was getting it right on uh, the environment, education, health, and treating the elderly and the disabled uh, disadvantaged properly. You know, so he's looking at quality of life, and he was making an argument that we don't understand where the economies of scale are if the largest of those nations was the Netherlands with 17 million. Um, it was a very interesting argument, um, but I was stunned to notice the correlation between what you've done in terms of where that movement has gone. Um, and that, and of course, another thing about it is most of those countries have got a level, they've leveled off demographically too. So the, the stuff's flowing into good, well-managed, small economies. Yeah, so um, I, I, I do think that the movement we've seen is toward the currencies of well-managed, smaller economies that have uh, followed uh, inclusive, stable economic policies over time on the, uh, on the basis of a social consensus that has a long history. And the question is whether or not they're, they're now changing as you see the same kind of political polarization in a number of those countries uh, that uh, they had been able to avoid historically. Um, whether, you know, my view is that when you have highly polarized polities like you do in the United States, you get uh, um, swings in uh, economic policy. And that's a big factor in the buildup of unsustainable debts as governments are trying to get spending in on their favorite programs before they're booted out of office by the other extreme uh, a party on the other end of the political spectrum, or they're trying to starve the beast by cutting taxes and preventing the other party when it comes into power from spending on its favored uh, programs. We've seen that kind of behavior in uh, Latin American countries that are famously polarized politically. So the question is whether that uh, political consolidation that the countries you listed have historically enjoyed may become a thing of the past. Yeah. Well, um, and by the way, um, I'll, if there are any Danes out there, no insult, Denmark was the one I missed. So uh, um, a final question then, if I may. Um, there, Roy Amara uh, had this adage uh, that people sometimes refer to as Amara's law. We tend to overestimate the effect of technology in the short run and underestimate the effect in the long run. And this has frequently been used as people sort of don't notice as technology creeps up on them and then suddenly it's it's everywhere. Um, it, you know, we, we, we said 2050, and I think the audience completely agrees with you. We, we can't see much further than that, but 2050, maybe it's going to be stable. But if there were a change, uh, would it be sharp and fast or would it be something that we would see coming? I think it would be sharp and fast 
uh, in a scenario where there is a much more serious conflict between the, the US and China, a scenario that we have to contemplate if uh, the US and China got into a shooting war is the most serious uh, way to put it. Uh, bilateral economic relations would stop. They would break down and there would be no uh, atheists in those trenches. Third countries would have to choose whether they were going to do business with China or do business with the US. Otherwise, they would be subject, they themselves would be subject to secondary sanctions. And the monetary and financial sphere would similarly break up into two blocks, one centered on the dollar, one centered on the renminbi. Short of that dire scenario in which we would have even more serious problems than these mere monetary issues, I think the uh, shift will continue to be glacial, ongoing, relatively slow. Uh, I'm hopeful that even with a uh, serious breach of the debt ceiling in the second half of this year, such a breach would be temporary and it wouldn't uh, seriously um, uh, cloud the prospects for the dollar. Wow. Well, Barry, this has been absolutely uh, fascinating, very well considered, very well presented. Uh, of course, Connolly's uh, somewhat of an insult, you know, it's our currency, it's your problem, it was 52 years ago, and yet this keeps coming up. We had the discussions just the other week, whether Brazil and Argentina might form a common currency, and everybody keeps talking about it, but the dollar just sort of soars through it, which I think is there. I, I almost want to leave uh, the final quote to that great economist, the uh, American humorist Joan Crawford. Uh, I think she says something like, I, Joan Crawford, I believe in the dollar. Everything I earn, I spend, um, which I thought was there. Um, well, if I could, three quick rounds of thanks. Uh, firstly, uh, to, uh, to our sponsors. Uh, secondly, to the audience. Uh, Barry will be getting all of your uh, comments, questions, and observations. Uh, thank you very much for kicking in and participating. It makes my, my job a joy, and it's really an honor to be able to run these things. But Barry, we couldn't do them. Uh, without some real experts like you coming here and sharing in such a nice and considered way your thoughts on, on the future of the dollar uh, as a reserve currency. I've enjoyed it. I've taken away something uh, in particular about those small nations that you spoke about. As ever, folks, the, uh, the, the best way to find out what's coming up is to go and look on the website, although I must say Monday's one on the Cairo, Genitza, and the medieval global trade amongst the Jewish communities, uh, particularly around the Mediterranean, is one I'm really looking forward to. Anyway, thank you very much, uh, all of you. Thank you, Barry, and look forward to seeing many of you again soon. And thank you, Michael, for convening the platform.